Okay, so you can see my pictures. You see my screen now? Yep, we okay, do. So, so I would like to say that um, I don't, I'm not like so many talented people. I don't take my own pictures, but I'm very grateful to people who let me use their pictures. And for instance, the spoonbill here is Tammy's and um, Jim Gray took the reddish egret. But I have a number of people who are really generous about letting me use their pictures for the various talks I give and so on and, and have over, you know, the last, you know, few years that I've worked for Audubon. So, but I was really glad to come and talk to you guys about these two species, which I think are very iconic for our area. And I think a lot of the stories that we know about bird life in our area is really told in the, the stories of these birds. So um, let's see. Okay, so how do I, how do I, how do I move forward? Oh. Um, nope. just, just hit, uh, try hit either hitting enter or your right arrow button on your, on your. Yeah, it's not. Keyboard. Can you, what about, what about your down arrow? Yeah, it's not, you know, I'm, I'm hitting all the buttons. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay, let me try this. Okay, so all the time when I talk about these birds, I'm, I'm always having to go all the way back to the beginning of what we know of what went on in Florida. And so John James Audubon, you know, visited Florida in the 30, 1830s, and he wrote about his visits in something called the Ornithological Biographies, which were unfortunately edited by his granddaughter, who then threw away the original um, writings. But, but it, at that time, he expressed real concern about the survival of spoonbills in Florida because they were being harvested for uh, their wings for sale to tourists just for souvenirs. And um, so if you had, for instance, a uh, tourist, um, a poor cracker would go and he could sell for each bird that he killed, he could get two wings. And so spoonbills were really having trouble and Audubon recognizing that that, that kind of pressure on a species might be a problem. You know, he was one of the first, first people who really recognized that the resources of this fantastic continent that the Europeans had come to might be limited. And um, that's why he is used as the um, names, you know, why we used him for the name of our society. But um, in any event, um, he, he made that note about spoonbills. And the second factor that really interfered with spoonbill survival in, uh, our, in the United States was super disturbance at the nesting colonies. So he also, when he visited the Florida Keys, and I just came across this quote, uh, quote um, when he went to Sandy Key, which is in the middle of Florida Bay, and it's very shallow there. So I'm just, met, and I've been to Sandy, Sandy Key, he calls it here Sandy Island. It's, it's part of Everglades National Park and the Marine Reserve there that's in Florida Bay. So he says, 20 miles our men had to row before we reached Sandy Island. And as on its level shore, we all leaped. And he was French, so he always has things a little bit weird the way he expresses things. We plainly saw the southmost cape of the Floridas. The flocks of birds that covered the shelly beaches and those hovering overhead so astonished us that we could for a while scarcely believe our eyes. Purple herons rose at almost every step we took. Purple herons, that's what he called reddish egrets. So now we move to W.E.D. Scott and we, we are you know, quite a bit later, 40 years later. And uh, W.E.D. Scott was a, 
an ornithologist who worked for Princeton University. And he came to Florida to shoot birds for the, the um, museum collection at Princeton. So he came to Florida three times and he wrote about his visit. And it just happened to be right at the time when um, the, the plume trade was happening. So he comes to Indian Key, which is now Indian Key National Wildlife Refuge. It's part of the Pinellas National Wildlife Refuges in, in Boca Ciega Bay, right near Eckerd College. So if you're going over the Skyway Bridge, for instance, you can look over and see Indian Key. But when he was there in spring, April of 1880, he talks about what he saw there. And I love the phraseology here. And I think you've heard me, some of you have heard me say this before. Just imagine from this description, a perfect cloud of birds. Then he also goes and he starts to list the birds. Now, I didn't put this part in here, but he says, I've listed them in the order of their abundance because it wasn't possible for me to actually give any numbers. But most, the most abundant birds were brown pelicans followed by magnificent frigate birds, man of war birds. And then the third animal he lists here are reddish egrets. And I just want to point that out. The third in the list are reddish egrets at this island that he was visiting. And he says, I have never seen so many thousands of large birds together at any single point. So he was a bird guy and he's completely astounded by what he's seeing. So here we go, 1880s, the plume hunting trade with big fashion for the aigrettes, the, the feathers of egrets used to decorate ladies hats. And you can see the egrets and the ladies, lady in the middle. You can see the, the very frilly feathers of, of the great egret. The great egrets are the scapular plumes, they attach between the shoulders and they're so important in terms of their courtship. So, um, and you can see with Miss Maraud here on the right side, she was the it girl. And so the it girl would have had diamonds, she would have had pearls and she had her egret feathers. Um, anyway, the egrets were sold for $32 an ounce and they finally went up to $80 an ounce. It was a way that the, the crackers, particularly in Florida, just dug themselves out of, out of poverty. They could go to the bird colonies and make a lot of money. So um, just, you know, the herons that had the, the aigrettes, which were the, the uh, marketable plumes, came to be known as egrets. So here we go. Here's W.E.D. Scott. He's come, he came to Florida first in 1880. Now he comes back and he's shocked. He's absolutely shocked to discover that the great rookeries that he had seen before no longer exist. And he rises up in, in the AWP, which is the American Ornithologist Union's um, journal. And this is what the um, people read and learned about the, the uh, devastation to the egrets and the other birds, including the spoonbills that were nesting in the same colonies with some of these, these, uh, these big heron colonies. Um, just truly devastated. So this is, this is very important that he wrote this up and his report leads to people starting to recognize that we cannot harvest these birds in this way if we wanna have them in, the, in our natural history of the United States anymore. So what is the result? Well, word, worldwide, and this was Australia, it was Texas, it was uh, um, Africa as well, Egrets were impacted, but especially in Florida. By 1900, egrets across the state were really missing. And especially reddish egrets were gone. They were really gone by 1890. But the reason that they were completely vulnerable was because they didn't nest anywhere in the inland of Florida. They nested only in the estuaries and the, and the, the hunters could get to every estuary island and impact every reddish egret that uh, 
that was nesting. So the result is all the radish egrets are gone and most of the spoonbills are gone, almost all of them. So now I just want, that's background. So now I'm gonna just kind of slide into a little bit different discussion. And I wanted to talk to you about the, the uh, fact that species are, it's such a good word, species, because species are specifically, specifically designed to efficiently and effectively get their food. And what they eat really design, does, uh, is really important in, in determining a lot of their behavior, almost everything having to do with their physiology, their structure, their, the way they're built. And because reddish egrets and rosy spoonbills mostly eat fish, spoonbills have a slightly larger diet and reddish egrets have been seen eating dragonflies and stuff like that too. But that being said, mostly reddish egrets only eat, eat fish. Now, what do we know about fish? Well, they swim around in schools. So if you were to defend a particular spot in the water, you might not have, you could have fish there or you might not. So if you're going to, you're in much better condition or situation, if you don't try to defend a spot, like say a mockingbird defends an area of a territory, but birds that eat fish don't do that because there's no point. They, there's no point in defending a territory because the fish might not be there. The best thing to do is to live near good foraging sites and then fly to where the fish are. So this is kind of interesting. So here we go and we look generally at colonial water birds and reddish egrets and spoonbills are colonial water birds. We call them that because they nest in colonies. One time I had somebody say, does that mean they were also here at the time of the 13 colonies? And I said, yeah, <laughs> but we call them colonial water birds because they nest in colonies, usually on islands. And the reason that they do that is because it takes a long time for them to raise their young. These are big birds and it takes months to, you know, for the eggs to develop in the, em the embryos to develop in the eggs and then the birds to reach, the, the chicks to reach flight stage. And during all that time, there's pooping going on, there's feeding fish and dropping fish, and there's a, there's a, you know, some birds are dying. So these islands tend to get this kind of odor. Well, mammals really focus on finding food by smell. So these birds cannot, man, they cannot survive if the mammals can find them. And the mammals can find them because of the fact that the nests are, you know, the birds are stuck there with their nests for literally months. And um, you can't hide if you're one of these big colonial water birds. Therefore, the adults find a place to nest that doesn't have mammalian predators. So how, where, how do you do that? Well, in Florida, we've got this dragon Oh, they're actually, we've got two species of dragons, alligators and crocodiles in South Florida that are very good at eating any raccoon or bobcat or any animal that's gonna try to swim across to a island that's got a bird colony on it. And then in the estuary, the islands that the birds choose to nest on the colony islands typically have deep water tidal channels around them, tidally. Uh, influence channels where the water moves in and out at speed twice a day or more. And the um, predators instinctively know that that is a bad idea to try to swim across a tidal current. And therefore the uh, nesting on those estuary islands is protected too. So where we've got some wonderful spots for red egrets and spoonbills. And I just Thought I would, you know, share some pictures of those with you. Um, you know, we've talked about Fort DeSoto before, and of course, Three Worker Island. Then the islands in the estuaries, um, particularly Clearwater Harbor Bird Colony, uh, I-25, um, and so forth. And then Coffee Pot Bayou is a really gorgeous mangrove island with a deep water channel all the way around it. 
The Alfai Bank is a spoil island, um, but it has the largest spoonbill colony along this west coast of Florida. It's about 180 pairs every year. Um, here's another mangrove island over in Boca Ciega Bay. And then the estuary uh, islands and, and oyster bars are in open flats are where these birds can feed. So we've got these two species and they're both listed as threatened species by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And why? Well, because their current population is very low in the state and because there's continued human impacts on the habitats that they rely on, as well as direct disturbance effects. So let's just start to talk about, about the difference, these two different species. Um, and you know, a lot of this stuff you guys know, so just bear with me if you already knew it. I hope I'll find something that you didn't know and that you might find interesting as we talk about them. Reddish egrets are the rarest here in North America. We've got somewhere between 350 to 400 pairs, who knows really, nesting in Florida. We did do a statewide survey about five years ago, um, and that's why we have a guess. They are very hard to survey. Um, probably around 4,500 pairs of this animal in the world. Their state list is threatened. The US Fish and Wildlife Service has them on on a, um, a, a list that of animals that could be added to the endangered species list, except that that list is so political. Um, they're on the National Audubon Society watch list. And if you remember, I told you, we didn't even have them in Florida by 1900. So what happens? So 1900, time goes by and here's our best friend, Frank Chapman. He is a wonderful biologist. He visits his, his mother in Gainesville a lot, and so he really loves Florida, um, but he is the curator of the American Museum of Natural History, and he's the editor of Bird Lore, which morphed into Audubon Magazine. So he comes to Florida. He's going to go to the look at the Cuthbert Bayou bird colony, which is in the Keys, and he sees what? Six reddish egrets. He's the first person who has reported seeing any reddish egrets in Florida for a couple of decades. So this was very exciting that he actually saw six of them on his way. Then here we go another 30 years and finally we have a nest. And it was documented in Florida Bay um, near, near Tavernier uh, by Mr. Desmond. He saw it in 1938, and this was the first documented nest that had occurred in Florida since the 1880s. And there's a slow population increase over the next 30 years. As reddish egrets um, increase their numbers, the, the young birds grow up and have young, and the population slowly increases, and the nesting of these animals moves north. In 1974, reddish egrets came again to nest in the Tampa Bay area where they had been in such numbers as reported by W.E.D. Scott, you know, in the, in the, in 1880. So the first place they nest is at the Alfie Bank. And they are also at the same time frame moving up the east coast of Florida and nesting at Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge on the, Hallover Canal Spoil Island. So this, this is just, I think, some really interesting information about nesting just in the Tampa Bay area. So you see here um, that um, from 74 to 1980, they nested only at the Alafaya Bank. You know, here's, here's the Inner Bay Peninsula, the Alafaya River, Pinellas County, Tampa's over here so on and so forth. So they only nested here at the Alafaya Bank. The next 10 years um, from 81 to 19, 1990, they're, started, they're, they're seen at Tarpon Key nesting there. They're, they're seen down here at, at um, 
uh, Bird Key in uh, Terracilla, which is Washburn Sanctuary. And they're also seen at Cortez Key in, um, in uh, Sarasota Bay. So the population is slowly growing and the birds are finding places to nest, starting to occupy their former range. So here's the next 10 years, 91 to 2000, still nesting at the Alafite Bank, Tarpon Key, um, Bird Key um, here and Cortez Key, but now We've got some nesting where we were today working, Mary, um, there at, at the Rock Ponds and over at Coffee Pot Bayou and various different points along, even uh, they're up in, in uh, Alligator Lake and, and uh, no, I guess this is, this is uh, Coffee Pot here. So, and then up into uh, Clearwater Harbor and St. Joseph Sound. And then here we come you know, in the 2000s and, um, you know, the number, the places what they're nesting is, you know, growing. So the point is they have pretty much reoccupied their former range. They are actually nesting as far north now as um, uh, uh, Cedar Key National Wildlife Refuge on Snake Island. So that's pretty cool. Um, so, this is hard for you guys to see, I know, but this is the current map distribution of reddish egrets. So where they're nesting is Merritt Island and some places along the East Coast, up this side of Florida, up to Cedar Key. Then there's no nesting from Cedar Key over to Louisiana. And then very big red nesting of reddish egrets in Texas, and then all down the Central America, there's a huge colony over in this area of uh, Mexico and they nest up in the, in the Baja Peninsula area too, as well as Cuba and um, uh, the Bahamas. So let's just talk about these birds for a second. I really think they're kind of super duper magnificent. And so, um, and this is what they do at courtship, at courtship, courtship time, um, starting in um, late February and so forth. And February, late, well, February, March, April, May, and so forth. The head and neck have these what are called lanceolate plumes, which means they curve around each other in a tight bundle. But that means that the birds can lift these up in particular ways for display. And I'll show you some pictures of that. The area around the eyes turns a purple and blue color. And then they have yellow eyes. And then um, the area near the, the base of the beak gets to be this bright, iridescent, fantastic pink, whereas the tip goes to glossy black. So this is. This is courtship. This is a bird who is hot to trot and he's ready to find, he or she is ready to find a mate. So they can lift all of these feathers um, is part of their display. And, and they, can, they use them in, to, to say, look, hey, honey, I'm a reddish egret, what about it? But they also use it to chase off another reddish egret um, that they may not want that close to them. They use, head tosses, they use um, a, a uh, kind of a dip display where they kind of dip their knees, um, their ankles and, and drop their body. And when they're doing the head toss, of course, they're showing off the, the bright pink beak and every feather is lifted. Now the courtship plumes, again, are scapular plumes and they come all the way down the, the back of the, the bird. They also have bright, bright blue legs. And one of the things that they do during courtship is they will fly low over an area um, where it, usually a male will fly over where a, a female is sitting up in the mangroves or where, wherever the nest site might be soon and, and dangle those legs, not tucked up against their body while they're flying when they're really going somewhere, but dangled and with a very uh, um, abrupt and fancy flight, like 
I can fly so easy. I don't have to do it very efficiently. And it's just very, apparently very, very sexy. So, um, and you can see this bird's got, you know, he's in breeding condition with the pink beak, the glossy tip and raising all of, all of the lancelate plumes of the head and neck. And then here's the, the uh, long feathers of, of courtship down the back. I don't have the picture with them doing the display. Now, once the birds are secure, they've got their chicks in the nest. They don't have to, to spend a lot of energy on showing off anymore because they're committed to each other. They, don't, they go into a different physical mode um, from estrogen and testosterone to we've got to take care of the babies um, and their beak color fades. Notice that this bird now, the beak color is not bright pink, still has the glossy tip, yellow eyes and the blue legs, but, but you know things are fine at home. We don't have to dress fancy. We don't need a Corvette anymore to you know, attract a girl so we can relax. So as the chicks get older, not only do the courtship um, colors of the beak continue to fade, but they get kind of a dark feather, a dark darkness across the top of the beak. And, and um, this biologist calls this the raccoon look, but it's just something to, that's interesting to see. But by now, October, and it, this was really clear in the picture that, was it Sandy that, no, it was, who showed that picture, Mary? Who showed that picture with the reddish egret at, at uh, Caroline showed. Um, yeah, the Cameron beak, DeVille, I think. Yeah, the bill is dark and all horn colored. Now this is a, an adult reddish egret. You see the lanceolate plumes. You see the, the breeding plumes is standing, standing past the tail. They're pretty worn out now. Those will be replaced in, at the um, beginning of the you know, midwinter. So here we go. What do they do when they're out foraging? Well, they forage in the estuary on the open mud flats and sand flats, and they're chasing schools of fish that can see them. Well, prey doesn't like to be prey. Prey likes to be fish, and prey doesn't want to be prey. So prey doesn't want to be eaten. And so what, in order to catch the, the fish, the little fish that these reddish egrets eat, they chase the prey down and they use their wings for balance and they chase after the school's uh, fish. And it's really fun to watch them. Um, and they're getting really, really, really small fish. They eat, they eat very small fish usually. Sometimes they'll eat a little bit bigger, but mostly actively chasing the schools of fish right at the edge of the water. They only do, they are strictly marine animals um, foraging on sand flats and mud, lat, mud flats only. So then when it's time to nest, this is, this is um, Mark Rochelle took this picture. We were, had been putting some signs up on a bird island and all of a sudden we look up and we saw this nest. Really, really hard to see the nests. Um, with the shadows of the, of the uh, trees and everything. And the birds are usually very quiet. They make stick nests um, and they um, work on that together. Typically the, the female will accept the sticks that the male brings to her. She doesn't wanna put her precious eggs in a sloppily made nest. So even though the nests don't last really from one nesting season to another, and, but courtship is part of building the nest is courtship. So if uh, the male doesn't bring the right sticks, she'll go find a guy that will. And if she doesn't build the nest properly, he'll go find a, a chick that can. So together courtship is very, um, building the nest is part of the courtship. It's a, a platform nest with a hollow in the middle that's lined with grasses and other soft materials. And then typically three to four eggs are laid um, and hatch in about 26 uh, days. So here's the reddish egret newly hatched. Um, you can see his, 
His siblings are still there. Um, just very ugly little guys. What can you say? Um, but they grow up pretty fast. And you can identify reddish egrets in the nest. They always have the, they're very brown looking. Um, these are the natal feathers that they hatch out with that help keep them warm a little bit. And then always with the yellow eye. So here's another reddish egret, some of the, the feathers coming in on this one. And they do grow very, very fast. Um, what happens at the nest is one parent is always on duty at the nest. And they really are there always from the time that you put the first stick on top of the other stick to create the nest. Because if you're in a bird colony and everybody's using sticks to make their nest and you go off and you leave your sticks, well, um, your sticks migrate to somebody else's nest very quickly. And you sometimes you can see birds stealing sticks from unattended nests. But then when the, the eggs are there, one of the parents is always at the nest to make sure that fish crows or other herons or, or um, other predators don't eat the eggs. And then when the chicks hatch and they're really little and vulnerable, they still need protect, to be protected. And they also need to be protected from getting too cold or getting too hot or getting wet. So the parent, one of the parents is always there, if not both. Both parents spend the night on the nest. Um, typically what happens is first thing in the morning, the male will fly out to um, forage and he needs to be back at the nest by no later than 11, 1130 because the female is hungry. She hasn't eaten yet. He comes back and he's brought food in his, in his stomach and he regurgitates it and, and feeds the young. And uh, the parents share the duties pretty equally. Um, but they do not leave the young chicks unattended ever. When the chicks get big enough that they're not going to be easily swallowed by fish crows or great blue heron, and they can also clamber away from any kind of direct threat, then both parents are out in the flight line getting the food to raise these teenage type chicks because they're growing so fast. And even after they can fly, the parents still will feed them. You can see here's an, here's an adult here with a chick behind it. And this one is an adult with two chicks in its brood. And what the adults will do is they will make the young follow them actively. And if the, the, the young don't do that, then they don't get fed because what's the point in feeding a baby if he's gonna die anyway? So they make the, the young really work for the food and learn how to use the equipment. You know, they've got these wings with feathers on them and they need to learn how to fly. So now here is a fledged reddish egret. So really an egret that is so hard to tell what it is. It's just brown all over, brown and gray, different kinds of modeling. They're not all exactly the same way that they look, but they all have this big sturdy beak. They're all mid-sized herons at this point. They're all, you know, essentially full size. Um, if you're a flyer, you cannot really grow um, after the time you are trying to fly because of the stresses on bones and ligaments. You have to be full size and fully equipped before you're fledged. So these are full sized animals. And again, the yellow eye helps us identify you know, a young fledged reddish egret. This is a, what we call a bird of the year. It hatched out in um, probably April. And um, this is probably July or August and he's, he can take care of himself. Now here's, here's a, a fledged reddish egret. You can see the mottling gray and brown feathers. He looks a little bit different from the other bird that we just saw in the slide before. But this is what they're catching, these tiny little little fish, and this is what reddish egrets live on. So just about the time we knew all about dark morph reddish egrets, it turns out that a small portion in Florida are actually white. And these, um, if you go to the Bahamas, the, the uh, proportion of red, red morph birds to dark morph birds is about 50-50. But here in Florida, 
only one in 10 or so of reddish egrets are white birds. And again, easily identified as reddish egrets by when they're in breeding condition, the pink bill near the base of the, um, the pink near the base of the bill and the glossy black tip, blue legs, um, the lancelate plumes on the head and shoulder. So here's some more pictures of, of uh, white morph reddish egrets. And again, absolutely identifiable too by the foraging strategy, very active forager. But even in the mangroves, you know, blue legs, pink bill, absolutely reddish egrets. And here again, look how tiny these little fish are that these reddish egrets are eating. It's ridiculous. It takes a lot of these fish. Now, they do mate um, reddish egrets, dark morph and white morph will mate. This is a pair that's been hanging around or had been hanging, I don't know if they're still there um, hanging around Fort DeSoto. Clearly a mated pair because these birds will not stand this close to another one of their species, except for their best friends already. So here's an adult reddish egret here with a white morph chick begging very act he's got to actively beg or he's not getting fed here's um three reddish egrets what we call branchlings they they're big enough to where they've left their nest but they're still being fed by their parents so they're hanging around the bird uh, colony and you can see one of them is a white morph and the other two siblings are dark morph they stand in sibling groups because again they're really not comfortable these are irascible animals, and they're not comfortable being um, that close to um, other birds. So now let's just look at what happened in the Tampa Bay area. This is just using the information that Coastal Islands collected over since 1974. And you can see that the population was on a pretty steep curve up until around 2004 and five, and then started to drop off. And since 2004 and five, it came down, did a little dip, kind of stabilized, you know, in the 50 pair. These are pairs, pairs in the area, and then has had a decline since then. And that decline really worries me. I don't know what, what's going on. So why, what are threats to the survival of reddish egrets in the state of Florida? And um, the loss of these estuary wetlands will never get the wetland foraging areas that were here when W.E.D. Scott saw these birds in the 1880s. We've done so much dredging and filling of our coastal zone that we just don't have those habitats in the, in the expanses that we had before. So we've got erosion of nesting islands and also disturbance at nesting islands, entanglement and fishing line, which is crazy, but it happens with reddish egrets. I've seen reddish egrets with fishing line. We don't know what the impacts of climate change, but we do know that weather patterns are getting crazier. And then we've got predators, um, raccoons and so forth, getting out to the places where the birds are trying to nest. So let's go on and talk now about roseate spoonbills. Another species listed by the state is threatened. In, the, in Florida, we've got 1,200, maybe a few more pairs. So this also is a really rare, a really rare bird. So um, here's a distribution map for roseate spoonbills. Uh, again, I'm sorry that it's not easier to see, but, but they are actually starting to nest up into Southern Georgia. They're very tropical species um, all around. Florida up, up to um, uh, Cedar Key National Wildlife Refuge. And then you kind of skip, um, you know, across the panhandle, none nesting there, but they are nesting in, in uh, Louisiana and certainly down the coast of Florida, the, the west coast of Mexico and the Bahamas and Cuba and so forth, and down into to, uh, the top of South America. So when we were talking about reddish egress, we were talking about a heron that visually spotted its prey, chased it around and grabbed it with that needle beak. 
but we've got a whole different situation when we're talking about roseate spoonbills. They are designed to forage in a completely different way. So while we're looking at this picture, I just want you to notice the naked kind of green head, the kind of bar of black from ear to ear across the back of the head, the pink eye, gorgeous red feathers across the top of the wing, gold over here in the shoulder area, pink legs, they actually have orange on their tail. And um, wow, what an animal. I mean, gee, this it's really quite, gorgeous to see spoonbills. I think everybody loves them so much. So what, the, what do they do? They use this open beak. When they're foraging, they are not visually seeing their prey. They are feeling their prey. The beaks are very sensitive. They are doing tactile foraging, not by sight. They, this means they can forage in muddy water or low light. Um, and what they do is, they swing that bill from side to side. So they swing the bill from side to side. So if you're a fish and you don't wanna be caught, what you do is, is you're, you're out in front of the spoonbill and the spoonbill is walking toward you. You go to one side of the predator or the other side of the predator. But the spoonbill gets you anyway because he swings his bill up over and he feels the prey fish, whether it's a fish or whatever else it's getting in the wetlands, in the estuaries, as well as the freshwater wetlands, and grabs it short, shut, grabs the prey, grab, closes that beak very quickly. And you can tell when they've got something because then they toss it back in the back of their throat and swallow it. But those shallow water areas must have very dense prey for this foraging strategy that is based solely on touching prey to work. And that's especially true when feeding young. So what these birds do is they wait for the spring drawdown to happen. Across Florida, over this um, period of the summer and tropical storms in the fall and so forth, have filled up all the wetlands and the water has moved out into the bottomlands uh, of around the wetlands and all the wetlands, all the ponds and everything are filled up and the wetland animals are, are just making use of, of the fact that they're able to get to uh, lots and lots of leaves and so on and they are making more wetland animals. So then winter comes in Florida and we get our winter drought. So the wet wetlands draw down and the prey becomes concentrated, more and more and more densely concentrated. And so spoonbills time their nesting um, periods to when the um, food is really easy to catch because the prey concentration is so dense in the wetlands. So small fish, shrimp, crabs, even snakes, and amphibians, all good stuff for a roseate spoonbill. And here I just like this picture a lot because it again shows you the, you know, the naked green head. Birds that forage in water and might have to stick their head in the water all the time, you know, feathers could get infected. So a lot of these birds do have naked heads, um, with storks do, which also forage in the same way and so forth. So, and you can kind of see a little bit of the orange on the tail in this picture, which is good. So here's, here's another picture again of a rosy spoonbill. So um, they do nest in clusters. This is a, a courtship flock um, down in, in uh, near the town of Cortez, Cortez Key Bird Sanctuary, um, which is one of the coastal island sanctuary islands. I don't know if you can see, but here's a reddish eager here. But anyway, so one of the things that the spoonbills do when they're in these courtship flocks is they do what we call sky gazing, where they'll take that very signature beak and put it up in the air. And that means that if you've got a beak like me, you might be the, the chick for me and let's get together. So again, they courtship, it, part of courtship is the um, making of the nest. Because they're working 
with forceps that are pretty clumsy. They typically have bigger sticks than the egrets. So you can almost tell a reddish egret nest, I mean, a roseate spoonbill nest is a roseate spoonbill nest because it's kind of clumsily made with bigger sticks because that, that spoonbill forceps that they're using to make the nest are just kind of more clumsy. But again, the chicks hatch out and they're already pink. And um, they grow really fast. The first thing they do when they're growing is grow legs. Um, because if they need to clamber out of the nest, their feet and their legs can help them get back in. And the other thing they really do is they are alimentary canals. And a lot of food goes in and the gray stuff comes out the other side, but, but it takes a lot of food to raise a spoonbill. Again, one of the adults will be at the nest all the time to protect first the eggs and then the vulnerable chicks from predation. And the chicks do grow up really fast. Um, Tammy took this picture at the Alafi Bank, but you can see this is a, a young spoonbill. He's almost ready to fly. And here's his parent, you know, getting ready. To, he's begging for food from his parents. They must actively beg if they're going to be fed. So here they are as flyers. These are, these are birds, young of the year, what we call them bird of the year, hatched out in um, uh, April. And this is July or end of June. They can fly, but they do not leave the place where they've hatched out yet because they're still not prepared. The bill is pretty little still. You know, it's got some growing to do and their parents are still feeding them. And here's one just a little bit bigger. And here's one that, this is a, a fleshed spoonbill. And um, actually their first year of, their whole first year of life or so, let's see, you can see that they actually have feathers, white feathers on their head. This is a young bird, you can tell because he doesn't have the red feathers on the, on the top of the wing here. And, um, you know, the legs aren't really bright pink. And here's one that's probably a one and a half to two year old. The, the feathers are starting to have dropped off of the head, you know, and the legs are starting to get pink. You know, he's growing up. So we've been monitoring spoonbills with the Tavernier Science Center. And when I say we, I mean Coastal Island Sanctuaries who as you know, I retired from, yay. Anyway, um, we did a banding project and, and Tavernier is still doing their banding project, but we did a banding project for about five years at the Alafia Bank and we banded about a thousand uh, spoonbill chicks. And the idea was we wanted to know where do these birds go after they've left, left you know, when they've flown away from the nesting island how early, how old are they when they start to breed? Because this is basic biological stuff that helps us with our management. Um, you know, do the, do the birds that nest in, in Florida Bay come up and nest in Tampa Bay? And do Tampa Bay birds go down and nest in, um, you know, Florida Bay? Is there mixing of these? We wanted to know all of this stuff. So we learned a lot by doing this project. We learned that Spoonbills are about four years old when they first breed. They almost never, Tampa Bay birds almost never go to, actually never go to, to Florida Bay to breed. And Florida Bay birds never come up to this part of the world to breed. Um, some of the Florida Bay birds nested, have been nesting within a foot of where their nest was last year. So this is just really interesting things that we really not needed to know. And here, here's our group. Some of you remember Rich, um, but um, this is Tammy. And um, so we were putting these bands on the spoonbills and um, this is Jerry Lorenz. Here's Tammy holding the spoonbill chick, the cute little thing um, to put the band on. And these were all individual um, bands. And then they also got the US Fish and Wildlife Service band. We climbed ladders and put the, um, the whole 
family, um, all of the siblings in the buckets and then um, put them back in the very same nest, very important. So then later we can see the bands on the birds that, that um, you know, that we can tell where they, where they are. This, this is a fledged young of the year, young spoonbill, and you can see the band on him. And we put biologists in the field to try to read all the bands um, that they could from while the birds were shorelings waiting for their parents to come in and feed them. And we, by that, we found out that almost all the spoonbills that we had banded in the nest, like 99% of those birds were actually re-identified as um, fledglings, so that was cool. So if you do see a banded spoonbill, please report it because we're still gaining information. Um, the Tavernier Science Center has been putting radio collars on some of their birds or radio you know, uh, tracking devices. And we had, I just have a little bit of information about this, but what their A bird, Adolphus, hatched out, uh, was banded down here in Florida Bay, and he flew as far north as Pasco County, and then he flew back to Nest. So th this was his um, vacation. He came up, spent part of the fall and winter up along this coast, but, but um, and, and the same thing with all of these birds. They all went, they were banded in the Keys, and they all went home to Nest in the Keys. So we've, these are kind of the, what we found out about these birds and we, how far do they go to forage? That's important, um, you know, all this information that we're finding out. However, we have been watching spoon, spoonbills move to different areas of the region and um, this is great. Now, after nesting is over and in the fall, then we get spoonbills, you know, all over Florida, really. And um, one time I remember we were driving up to Atlanta in um, September and we saw a spoonbill flying over in Georgia, flying over Interstate 75, almost had an accident. But the point being, you know, the dispersal after the nesting time is over is widespread. So, let's see. The nesting population again, from, from the you know, early 1980s was when they first started to nest in our area actually. And then you can see very you know, strong rise and then kind of a drop off after around 2006 or something. And um, the number has kind of stabilized at about 250 pairs in the greater Tampa Bay area. So, um, with almost 200 pairs at the Alify Bank every year. So why are spoonbills having trouble? Well, again, we keep impacting our estuaries and our freshwater wetlands, coastal development, erosion, disturbance at the nesting colony. We've had some problems with nature photographers during courtship, entanglement with fishing line, I hate that. We don't know really what climate change is gonna do, but we also have predators sometime at the island. So when we talk about the population of humans, we all know that it's ridiculous for our area. It's just, we're growing at such a, a rate. And when we look at the widespread loss of, of the estuary foraging habitat, this is re gonna never be recovered when we've dredged and filled these areas out so much. Um, Water quality is really, really important for spoonbills. The food has to be in the wetlands and the season that they naturally have to have it. And it's gotta be abundant. That spring drought is really important. Where we've got um, manipulated wetlands where things don't work in a natural fashion, where we don't have shallow water area um, next so that these wading birds can wade and, and forage you know, these things are really impacts to these birds. Recreational boaters can reach every island that reddish egrets nest in, and they can reach a lot of the places that spoonbills, which nest, a lot of them nest in the estuary too. So what are we doing about this? Well, 
Um, Coastal Island Sanctuaries has been surveying every single colony that we can find along the coast to find out where they nest and, um, and you know, what nests everywhere. This is not everywhere, but this is just the, the regional sites that we visit every spring. We're working on protecting the islands from erosion with, and, and this is the Tampa Audubon crew. Remember when we did that, Mary? We, we did that um, along Bird Island with the reef balls here. Right. Um, the R Roberts Bay Islands are protected now with a really very substantial um, breakwater. And uh, here's the Bird Island breakwater here on the south side of the island. And we just last year finished a big project um, at the Alify Bank where we put these giant uh, structures to stop erosion from the ship traffic and the northern, um, the storms coming down in the winter from the north. And uh, that was over one and a half million dollars. So we have a lot of problems with nature photographers or have had, and we've gotten critical wildlife area status for some of the most important places for spindles and red shegrits in the region, including the Alify Bank, Dot Dash, um, Bird Island, down in uh, Bradenton, and then uh, the, the Roberts Bay Islands. So this is, this is very helpful, we hope. Um, Spoonbill dead in the trees. This is sad. And um, fishing line is really a problem for all of the birds, particularly pelicans. This is something that we've been working on, you know, with, you know, Tampa Audubon's taking such a leadership role on this. It's really a big deal. This is a spoonbill, you guys. So Colony Watch, very helpful because of um, when volunteers can help staff keep an eye on some of these bird islands, that really makes a difference. And um, one, let us know what's nesting there and if there's any problems. And then lots and lots and lots of signs and actual patrol during the nesting season. Um, every weekend and holiday, our favorite person, Carol Castles, is out. And then during the week, you know, um, the Coastal Island Sanctuary staff is out too to make sure that there is no trespassing on the island. So that's it. It took an hour. <laughs> All right. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a bunch of questions, Anne, that came in. Okay. Um, and I will say, I'm just going to read down through some of them. These were in responses to your award. Well done. Congratulations. Well deserved. Congratulations. Congratulations. Such a well deserved uh, honor. So lots and lots of thanks. Um, let me see. I am going to stop the recording.